Hello everybody, welcome to Discussing Tabletop. It is June 29th, 2019. Of course, this is our, ooh, what number is it? 117th show uh, that me and Joe have been doing here for, for next to forever, because that's what we do. It's auspicious. <laughs> I know. Uh, but today we have a guest with us, of course. We have uh, Ed, uh, Ed, uh, I'm going to, might butcher your last name, uh, Healy, uh, who of uh, Gamerati. Yeah. Uh, who has done some work with uh, God? I, I forget who it was of Crafty Games that we had on the show here. We had... Howard, Patrick Capera, maybe? Probably. Or Jeff, or Jeff Alex? Did you talk about Mistborn or we Spycraft? Talk, we talked about both. We ended up talking about mostly Mistborn, but we ended up talking about Spycraft too. Uh, did the person have hair, or did they have a nice? wonderfully groomed blonde we talked to them in january so my brain has forgotten already <laughs> it's cool man i i would have to go back into all of my uh emails and like and and, and the previous episodes to like so be like you talk to patrick flag or alex capera you just mix their think, names just, you know <laughs> <laughs> i think it was alex i think it was alex cool okay yeah. But, uh, All right. So yeah, so you've done some work with them. Uh, so we're gonna talk yep. to you about Gamerati and like you know people you work with. Um, sure. And then uh, we're gonna move on to our regular topics, which we have the D and D new book, uh, the Acquisition Incorporated book, which is I guess their new uh, information from that game in book form. Uh, then uh, do talk about a little bit of magic with their core set tokens, which are a new format. Uh, I've got Teens in Space, an RPG that's based on the Kids on Bikes RPG, basically their system, and then two board hey, games. Did, do you know if Ivan actually contributed to some of the design on the Teens in Space thing? I don't know. Now I, now I have to ask him. <laughs> I love Ivan. He's awesome. Mm -hmm. I, then, you know who I'm talking Ivan Van Norman. I, yeah, that I know. It's the RP. Okay, cool. I knew I knew him by name, but that's like <laughs> the best I can do sometimes. Uh, putting names to what they do sometimes. That I have to like look at my uh, all my notes and stuff. Um, cool. And then we got two board games I want to talk about: Flotilla, a new one announced by WizKids, which seems kind of cool, and uh, Clip Cut Parks by Renegade Game Studios, where you're actually cutting stuff with scissors. Well, I'll stick around as long as you guys. Uh want to have me and as long as i can contribute meaningfully to the conversation without totally distracting from what you want to talk <laughs> well, about i mean we can always move the topics around then too i'm an agent of chaos so <laughs> all right well, you know you'd be like hey we're gonna talk about this cool board game like look butterflies you know <laughs> well why don't we start by you know our discussions with you and why don't we start talking about uh what is gamerati the easiest way to explain what we do is we don't publish anything. And we do everything else. It's just what we do for companies depends on what they need, right? So um, some companies just hire us to do a little bit of marketing for them. Some just want us to fulfill orders for them. So we have a warehouse about 10 feet that way. Um, and uh, some people want us to run their Kickstarter campaigns, but they don't want us to ship product for them so it really just depends but the three main things we do is marketing crowdfunding and logistics okay cool uh, Joe you want to ask a question um, actually bringing up a topic that was brought up last week um, with the possible tariffs going into China how do you think that's going to affect your business none I don't <laughs> think they're going to happen mm -hmm. that's just me um, a couple days ago uh, at the G whatever summit, um, I think it was Time Magazine ran an article saying that the U.S. and Chinese trade delegations got together and said, we don't want to do a trade war. Can we just figure this out? So I'm pretty sure it's not going to happen. I could be wrong, right. but... Um, with the, We had someone on last week that was very worried about it, so with an update this week, you know, that's more like, hey, it's sounding a little better. You know, as I said, yeah. as we were saying about last week, we're we're at a weird point because we are games media that you know we do worry about this thing just because you know we're connected with the game companies. Well, it's smart, right? Like the worst part is, let's say you, let's say the three of us made a, a board game, and uh, we hired Watts to to make it. It's probably a card game. Let's say a little teeny card game. We had Watts print it for us, and then all of a sudden, 
there's a tariff. So our cost just went up 25%, but we can't really charge more to the people who already give us money. So we're kind of SOL. Uh, that's that's the uh, that's the danger, but um, I'm not really that concerned about it. I, I, if it happens, it happens, but I have a feeling if they know what's gonna happen, they're gonna warn us. They're gonna say, um, this is going into effect on this date. The US, there's a, U.S. government agency, which I can't remember because I'm not my logistics manager. He is. Um, so Joey, my logistics manager, would be able to tell you the actual name of the company, uh, the part of the government. But it's the ones that give you the codes that you put on your shipments to say what they are for tax purposes and for import duties and whatnot. They did. They said, we're not going to issue new codes. We're going to issue this one temporary code because even they didn't think that it was going to happen. So, yeah, I'm pretty bullish. Uh, I don't think I don't think it's going to be a problem. It is kind of a concern, though, and I think it's something it's it's kind of something that a smart business will take into account for future. I think the best thing you're going to see out of it is some companies are going to start considering um, manufacturing in the US for certain things like Crafty, who you talked to before. Um, they manufacture little wizards in the US, and um, I think they do all the Mistborn uh, RPG stuff in the US. Uh, I know some companies manufacture stuff in Lithuania. Um, the problem is that the prices aren't usually as good, but if you're going to have a 25% increase in your costs from China, those prices t start becoming competitive. Um, it may not, they may not be as good as China, but you know, if it used to be this much of a differential, and then now it's only this much of a differential, but the difference is that I get my stuff three months faster, I may spend the extra money and just manufacture in the U.S. Interesting. So. Now there is definitely like two two sides of your business like we we've talked to some people right. that have done marketing but like mm -hmm. you said you're like the like and we've talked to some people about crowdfunding but i would like you know let's start with that what's okay. your experience with you know because you are hitting up a lot of crowdfunding you know uh, you know with that well i can give you the exact numbers if you give me about three seconds I can give you three uh, seconds. We <laughs> have worked on 483 successful campaigns that have raised $73.4 million. That's, so, that's a lot. That's my, that's my yeah. experience. My latest experience, um, let's see, the last two campaigns that we worked, that we ran, Soup to Nuts, was the Grimmer Space RPG one, the Starfinder setting with Sean Astin and Iron GM Games. Um, and uh, a little card game called Dungeon Brawler, first time designer. Uh, my logistics guy thought it was cool and he actually um, gave enough feedback that Patrick said he was gonna give him a, an additional design credit on the game. So um, those are our last two campaigns. Uh, we've got a couple more coming up uh, probably this month. Well, in July, the Guar versus Time deck builder game is gonna go on Kickstarter. So um, I don't, do you remember a game called uh, Poo? It's a little card game about monkeys throwing poop at each other. I actually remember I've heard that of it, one. yeah. Yeah. Okay. That is made by Matt Grau from Wildfire, who also does Cthulhu Tech, the role playing game. Uh, which is a phenomenal game by the way. Um and um they got the license to do Guar vs. Time, which is a Guar themed deck building game. And that's going on Kickstarter in the, within the next month. So uh, that's our biggest one coming up this summer. Cool. Yeah. So uh, by the end of the year, we'll have uh, worked on or managed more than 500 campaigns. Wow. So That's a lot. That's, yeah. that's... We have about six going at any given time. Uh, so I'm guessing you've got, like, a lot of experience. And it sounds like you're very successful. Like, you know, uh, that's I guess that comes to the other thing, because there's always mm -hmm. a lot of, well, logistics in it. And... Um, do you do you find that you need to help a lot of smaller companies with a lot of those the logistics side of things? Yeah, I mean, honestly, most publishers are small, right? I mean, we work with larger publishers, but um, let's say the three of us are running a, a, a game publishing company, right? And um, let's say I'm the guy that has money, and um, one of you is a graphic designer and one of you is a really good editor and game designer, but none of us know how to 
manufacture anything and, and maybe none of us are really good at marketing that's pretty much how i got started so um you know companies that are small don't have all those tools or heaven forbid we actually succeed right and we we have a really popular product well we're too busy making stuff to to worry about all the other stuff we don't want to stand up a warehouse or you know you hire your cousin's brother or something like that to do it and he's a total idiot and he drops the ball so you're like well that didn't work out i'm, I'm basically telling you the story of how i hire uh, my programmers and screwed it up so you know like you seem like a pretty cool guy i'm gonna hire you well you totally screwed that up so uh, you know bob says that you're a pretty good programmer so i'll hire you that didn't work out so <laughs> excuse me uh, sorry about that i didn't mean to cough in your ear um no problem so i mean that's how it goes with with publishers too they um they think that they're going to be able to find a solution but then they usually the problem is they get successful and they don't know how to scale and so the two biggest errors they make is hire friends and family people that don't know what they're doing either um or they they're successful and they staff up like they're a video game company and they just waste a lot of money because they're not used to running a business and the big prop the big the first question everyone needs to ask themselves in all this is do i want to be published or do i want to be a publisher and most people don't realize once you run a kickstarter you're a publisher hmm. you're running a business and if that's me and the three of us i mean 60 percent of 60 percent of my time is emailing and spreadsheets and taxes and stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with making games directly um, and that means that of the three of us that means I'm really only here half time because the other half of my time is spent doing stuff that has nothing to do with making games and so that's where we come in sometimes usually what happens is people buy ads from us on like Ian World or something and then they go oh that went well um, can you do more and then eventually over the I mean that's what happened with uh, Crafty Games for instance I met them at a con convention in Vegas 10 years ago that I sponsored um, and we just hung out and then they wanted some advertising. I, I was doing podcasting actually at the time and um, you know, they came on our show, they liked it. We just started being friendly and then over the years, every time they would say, you know, what we could really use this X and I'd be like, I'll do that for you. And um, so now I have a service con consolidation company, but I still don't publish anything. That's an interesting uh, origin story for the company. Yeah. Yes, that's my comic book uh, 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 issue zero story. <laughs> Joe, you got a question before I go to the next one? Um, no, go ahead. Okay. I, I was going to ask, like, um, because you obviously are into the tabletop circuit, how did you get into tabletop? Like, at all? Like, just hobby sure. wise? Yeah, or. Sure. Like, well, I guess oh, let's start with hobby-wise, um, you know. <laughs> I, I, was, uh, I was at a sleepover at a New York State um, thing. It's called Five Rivers. It's a nature reserve in upstate New York for the Boy Scouts. And um, one of the guys had uh, a red box D&D, &D, the Frank Metzer one. Mm. And uh, so then I begged my mom and dad to get it for me. And um, they bought it for me for my birthday. And then my mom was my first DM. And quickly, she said I needed to find friends because she didn't want to play every day, um, and I did. So uh, Tommy McDonald, my friend from Boy Scouts, and I would. This is back when um, the school library had a subscription to Dragon and Dungeon magazine, so that was awesome. Um, and we would just spend all of our time and money um, with graph paper and watching the D&D cartoon and listening to heavy metal and watching WWF before it was WWE um, and playing D&D. So that's, that's how I got started on the hobby. And pretty much I was just D&D only. Um, it wasn't until, I mean, I always had board games in the house, but board games really were a thing in the 70s. So, um, I mean, they existed, but not the way they do now. Right. Um, and then in college, is when I jumped into the industry side. Okay. Uh, all right. Sorry. Uh, okay. So, what about you? Oh, for me? Um, yeah. Oh, well, that's that's an interesting origin story. Um, I blame my brother. He brought home uh, second edition stuff and was like, here, I want to test it out with you. And that's okay. where I started. 
Uh, and he also had... Like Greyhawk or... Yeah, I can't remember which one he had. I remember... The, the one I really remember is he had the... When, during the second edition of AD&D, he got the mm -hmm. old... They had redone the reprinting of first edition stuff. and I think it was a black box, it might have been. Oh, okay. And yeah, they had a lot of black box stuff. So. Wasn't that the ones that had like the CD-ROMs in them? It might have been, but it was like the old like reprinting of the first edition stuff. So he had got me on okay. like a first edition adventure, and that got me into it. And I was like, <laughs> sure. And then through elementary, that was that was like elementary school for me though. So I started very young. And it wasn't for many years until I got into other stuff. <laughs> what about you, Joe? Um, I actually didn't start until high school. I had a friend that um, I rode the bus with who. He's like, hey, you might be interested in this. Why don't you join the, um, this gaming club we have in school? You guys had a gaming um, club in school. We did. We yeah, it's called club. SGS. That's Simulating pretty awesome. Yeah. Simulating Gaming Society. That's, Simulating Game Society? Yeah. yeah. That's that's where our origin together came up with. We went to high school together. When I came into high school... So you didn't we... actually play games, you just simulated <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Pretended to play games. You pretended uh, to pretend. <laughs> pretended, yeah. a, you should just call it the Meta Gaming Society. <laughs> oh man! And my first game was Cyberpunk. Okay. That's... So you're excited for the new Cyberpunk? Yes, actually, we just talked about that um, Cyber last week. Or Cyberpunk before? Red is the new yeah. edition, and then there's also this well, the video game too, which I'm curious as to how much it's actually linked to the game. I don't care. I love cyberpunk as as a genre. So, mm -hmm. well, I'm I'm he's the cyberpunk fan. I'm the Shadowrun fan because I like some fantasy in my cyberpunk. <laughs> right on. You got fantasy in my cyberpunk. <laughs> um, so like when you moved into the industry, I guess uh, did you did you think about did you want to go into publishing or anything like that to begin with? Because you said you were doing a podcast. Like, uh, what was your original oh, goal? So. So yeah, okay. So I was a publisher before. I kind of cheated. Um, so I took a semester off of college in ninety, the f spring of ninety four. Um, so from the from December ninety three through the summer of ninety four, I wasn't in college. I was overseas in Bulgaria. Actually, um, my parents were. My dad was a um, well, my parents were missionaries, but my dad was a um, economics professor at a local college there, and um, I forget what my mom was doing. So I went to visit them because why not? And um, I went there for Christmas um, after my third semester of college, and I met a really cute girl. So I decided not to go to college, and I went back to court her. Um, and then when I got back to the states to um, go back to college. Um, I was actually a business major and I'm in the business school typing up some report and I look over and some guy's got funny looking graphics on his computer, Netscape Navigator. Um, I'm like, ooh, what's that? And he said, it's the internet. And I'm like, that's not the internet. The internet is where I like play Zork and get tablature for my guitar because I didn't know that there was a graphical internet yet because I'd been gone for nine months. Um, and, you know, I, I put in Alta Vista, which was the search engine of the time dungeons and dragons of course and got tracy hickman's uh, homepage, and he was doing um star shield which is a shared world project of novels that he was doing with um, margaret weiss and the turns out that the guys that were doing the role-playing game went to my high school so i connected with them um one of them owned my um, local game store and uh, i just volunteered um, and then we ended up me the guy that owned my local game store and another guy started eden studios so we did uh conspiracy x all flesh must be eaten um buffy the vampire slayer um angel a bunch of other games um and then right after all flesh and before buffy i got a real job so i left the industry and i came back into the industry when i was deployed um to help uh, wolf bauer with his uh Cobalt Quarterly magazine. I don't know if you remember that. Oh God, Cobalt Quarterly. No. Uh, Paizo announced that they were not going to do Dungeon and Dragon magazine anymore. Yeah. And um, Wolf started doing a magazine called Cobalt Quarterly, 
and so I helped him with his advertising, but it was mostly just because he's a friend, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, actually, I, he wasn't really a friend. He was just a guy that I was patronizing. This is before Kickstarter, patronizing his open design projects, and we became friends. Yeah. Um, essentially, I got him advertisements from Eden Studios, which was my old company, and Green Ronin, and I think one other. And he offered me a beer, and I asked him for a job. So that's how my business started. Nice. Yeah. So I wanted to be a designer. When I was deployed, I, I thought, I want to write for Paizo, but I have, I'm have i Irish, so I have no luck. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Murphy's Law, if Ed tries to do something, chances it, one of two things is going to happen. It's going to go really good, or it's going to totally bomb. In this case, me trying to be a credited writer totally bombed. I had like five or six articles um, accepted by Paizo for Dragon and Dungeon Magazine, and then um, Wizards pulled the rug out from under them. So I saw how untenable that whole thing was, plus what I realized, what I thought was that I wanted to be a writer, and then I realized how much I hate writing. So, um, But I was really good at helping people, and that's what I really like to do. So um, I like helping people connect with other people, which is, I mean, I connected you guys with a couple of people, I think. Yeah. Um, that's what I actually like doing, finding people that are making cool stuff and people that are doing cool stuff and like bringing them together. Cool. So, so that's Gamerati is basically me just trying to help people find people. Oh, that's that's definitely a, a like the description of the origin of it is kind of like cool sounding, but like when you say like that's like how it like it evolved, that actually sounds mm-hmm. like really you know awesome. Joe, did you yeah. have a question? Well, going back to the personal realm for a moment, um, what is your favorite role playing game now? Is it still D and D? I like Savage Worlds. Okay. Honestly, um, it's the easiest game to pick up at a convention. Um, you can skin it like nobody's business. Um, I like all sorts of games, but the easiest one to play is Savage Worlds. Plus, I mean the the it, do you guys are you guys familiar with Savage Worlds? A little bit. I've only played a little bit of stuff from it, but I'm familiar so more with a lot the of the initiative skins. system. It, yeah, the initiative system in Savage Worlds, which is based on Deadlands, which is a uh, wild west poker and you know a kind of theme thing with zombies and, and stuff so the initiative system was playing cards and there's something about that system and i don't know if shane meant to do this or he stumbled upon it and go, went oh, wow I, this is awesome i'm gonna run with it but it's something about me holding that card in my hand and then releasing my action into the game when i when i play it um it keeps people from doing this while they're playing they're actually focused on the game. They're not looking right. at, you know, I, I find. Plus, um, at conventions, a lot of pickup games. Uh, Savage Worlds really does lend itself well to, to nice little pickup games. My first experience with it was uh, Savage Mega Man. So we played Mega Man Savage Worlds, and it was just some guy's Savage World skin that he had at uh, Fear the Con 10 years ago. Um, and since then, and the funny thing is, I don't know how to make a character in Savage Worlds at all. <laughs> I've never done it but I really love playing it. So I've, I've never ran Savage Worlds, but I play it a lot. Uh, um, I like running 3rd edition D&D, I'll be honest with you. Ooh, so, yeah. you know, I've been running a Plane of Shadows campaign for 15 years. So um, I just, you know, I, I, I looked at um, porting it over to 4th edition, but they messed up the Shadowfell so much that I just didn't want to. And then 5th edition, I've thought about porting it over to um i've got 15 years worth of content that i don't know if i want to port it over i think if i ever stop running my third my uh plane of shadows campaign i'll probably um i'll probably start up a fifth edition one i mean i play in a fifth edition one intermittently over skype with some buddies of mine um but i I pretty much am a DD player yeah I mean, that's where I started, and that's kind of what I love. But lately, most of my gaming has been board and card products. They're just easier to get people to play. Yeah. Uh, so. Do you have a lot of experience, or did you have you looked into, like, Pathfinder, though? Because they were sort of like an evolution. I love, I love Pathfinder. Yeah. yeah, so um, it's funny. I set up the first IRC chat with um, for Pathfinder when they announced it. Uh, this is before Liz Quartz worked for Paizo. I mean... Um, and then she took it over because she's more technically astute than I am. 
and uh, then she started working for Paizo, so that was nice. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I was really involved in like the first year of Pathfinder. Um, and then honestly, what happened is uh, my kids were young enough that I decided I wanted to step back from the industry a little bit and just like be a dad while they didn't mind me being around. Um, so I didn't play as much games. And then by the time I came back to Pathfinder, it, was, it had gotten so big, I couldn't keep up. Um, but yeah, for the first like year, year and a half, I was really, really deep into Pathfinder. And now that second edition is coming, I'm kind of playing around with the idea of going back to it a little bit. Um, obviously with Starfinder. I'm familiar with it because of the Grimmer Space stuff that we did, but um, I'm not running or playing in a Pathfinder game right now yet. Okay, I'm probably gonna play in a Starfinder campaign. I, I think the only experience that we had with Starfinder is we got to test it out at two years ago at PAX Unplugged. They had yeah. at, at the Paizo booth. They had it to test it out, and I think a friend of ours owns the book, and that's as far as I've gotten. It does look cool though. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm more of a dark person when it comes to my my fandom so like in second edition you were talking about second edition D &D, i really liked uh, dark sun yeah. um because i really really liked the uh, defilers <laughs> do you remember them they were the uh, in, in dark sun magic sucked yeah. the life force out of things the defilers were the ones that didn't give a crap and they would just like oh great i need to cast a spell i'm gonna kill this cactus or i'm gonna suck the life out of this little child or whatever and i thought that was pretty awesome i i tend to like uh, macabre uh stuff a little bit more yeah. so um so for me grimmer space is my bag right it's gonna it's got horror it's got space monkeys and, I mean, not space monkeys but you know it's, it's got space goes got space marines that'd be cool um i kind of like like the idea of playing in an interstellar um, game with uh, tentacle monsters from beyond space and time, that kind of makes me feel happy. So, no, I, I think I'm going to give it a shot. You know, uh, just talking about AD&D, my, my two favorite were, I did, I always loved Ravenloft, because I always thought that was an interesting one. And It is awesome. And then the other one was, I liked Spelljam, because it was like that, it was such interesting as like, it's not a technology-based space adventure. Have you tried uh, Mind Jammer from uh, Margaret Weiss Productions? <sighs> no, from, uh, sorry, Mind Jammer Press. Mind Jammer, I, I haven't had a chance to try Mind Jammer. I'm, I, we, we talked about it a while ago with one of their releases. Yeah. I'm going to put it in chat in that way, if anybody wants to check. Oh, oh, I can't I can, because I can I'm not a moderator. That. I can. Here, I'm going to put it, put it in our chat, not the... Yeah, yeah, I can... Joe, if you can share that, because then the I don't night, have to... The, the Nightbot. Okay. Nightbot, I, was I have to play with it more, but Nightbot is a bad thing, because... <laughs> Nightbot, it's hard to regulate it to not be a jerk. But then again, okay. it, it controls jerks, so it's the weird catch-22. Are you saying I'm a jerk? No. I mean, it's true, but... Uh -huh. <laughs> no, I, you can just... I post, post it in the Discord chat, so you can... Yeah, I got it. Joe's a moderator, because if I didn't, that would be weird. <laughs> As the co-host of the show, uh, Joe tries to post that Nightbot says, "No, I'm turning it." <laughs> Nightbot. That. Oh, that that didn't happen Actually, early, the first time. Can do that because he <laughs> forgot to do that originally. Can't it, my friend, but you're not my friend. You're a bad person. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Sounds about right for Nightbot. <laughs> God, bad <Yeah>. bot. <laughs> No so yeah, uh, a mind jammer seems pretty cool. It's um, using the I think BRP, which is the rule set that underlies Call of Cthulhu. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But it is heavy. Well, start. I mean, mind jammer. I mean, it's basically spell jammer, right? Like has very in the name, but it's a it's a whole world. It's very very well put together. Sarah, um, the one that wrote it all. Um, is a phenomenal author. They even have novels and stuff. I'm looking at the page right now while I'm talking to you. Sorry, I should probably bring it over here so I'm not... You, well, know, you, know, you don't have to look at the left side of my head. That's, that's the one thing I... Uh, well, I gotta watch that too, because like I, I've got the tools, two screens too, and I gotta make sure to keep the file, the one that actually has the camera. Right. Uh, but I, I think that's the thing I have to say about uh, RPGs nowadays, is like any kind of strange genre or genre combination you could think of, you're probably going to find something for it, and it's really like an interesting revolution now. With them. Well, that's how I got into... That's how I connected with the guys from um, 
wildfire that they're doing the guar thing is i was at my local game store and somebody was playing cthulhu tech which is lovecraft meets mechs so <laughs> Love you know, that. it was freaking cool man it was like i don't know what you're playing but it looks really cool and they're like hey you want to play with us i'm like yes i do and so i just sat down and played with them and i was sold it was such a it's such a cool setting um and that's how i got introduced to their stuff so yeah i like mashups I've always wanted to do Smex, which is like Smurfs and Max. <laughs> it doesn't exist, by the way. It's just like it's just my go-to. It's my go-to. I really want to see somebody like Stan, you know, the artist. This worked on DD. I want him to do like a Smex game. He did a kaiju. He did a gingerbread kaiju game, <laughs> where you actually make gingerbread monsters, and then you fight, and then when they like one guy's arm gets, you're supposed to eat the arm off the off the creature. Like it's literally a consumable. RPG, <laughs> which I think is hilarious. I don't like gingerbread, but you know maybe I make like sugar cookie kaiju, you know, <laughs> chocolate chip cookie kaiju. That would be a very short game, <laughs> but <laughs> it, it, it's like uh oh, <laughs> it's too delicious. Uh, uh, I think I've hit up most of the good topics I wanted to hit up. Joe, do you have a couple more questions that you can think no, of? No, um, I think we hit everything. Because this has been actually really cool. great talking with you anyway. Um, I mean, right. if, if you mind sticking around for a little bit, maybe we can hit a couple of topics. Yeah, to hit it, and, and I will I will try to participate as best <laughs> I can without derailing the entire conversation into comedy. All right, cool. Uh, let's talk about the latest D&D release, then, Acquisitions Incorporated, because this is like a weird thing. So... It, it, if anybody out there is not familiar, at a lot of the packs, they run a specific D&D game with uh, Chris Perkins, the people that, uh, who's one of the big writers on D&D now, and two of the players are the Penny Arcade people who are the founders of packs. So it is a major event, and apparently somewhere along the way they decided to make a book giving information on, I guess, their version of Faerun and the stuff that they've thrown together in these adventures so that you could use it in your own games. So it's... It makes sense. Why not? I know. It's just, I, f I always find these, like, little, like, um, circular things of, like, creation very interesting. Is uh, that the one that's gonna have, like, the, uh, the cutesy mind flare? I think so. Yeah, I, I think so, too. And the, it, like, the, the, like, devil chicken or whatever. Yeah, the abyssal chicken. Yeah. yeah. I, I thought that was hilarious. Um, <laughs> Eric Bauer from Gaming Paper posted a tweet about it, and I was just like, oh, that's fun, I guess. Yeah, I saw uh, I saw Chris Perkins tweet when he was like, this is in the book, like, kind of like announcing this is in this book. It's like, or, and I'm like, that's, that's a weird looking thing. <laughs> Why is it a chicken? It looks just like a chicken-shaped monstrosity. <laughs> Honestly, you can't have enough comedy in your games. Uh, I think sometimes they get a little bit too serious. So throwing a little AI, you know, acquisitions incorporated and making it kind of goofy for a little while, I'm all for that. I mean, every TV show that's worth its salt does some experiments eventually anyway. Like, yeah. uh, you know, even Buffy did a musical episode, right? Yeah. So, yep. So why not? But, you know, throw, throw some anime into your cartoons into your uh, gritty D, D campaign. Uh, <laughs> why not? I, I would always support more anime in your D D campaigns. <laughs> I, I like Bessem, so I mean that's the that's the anime RPG. Nice. You ever uh, play Anima? Anima? No, I haven't tried Anima. Okay. Um. No. It's unfortunate. It's like, uh, it, it my my experience with a lot of RPGs is usually reading up on them and less playing them. Unfortunately, nowadays, which is really sucks. yeah, finding the time to spend forty hours to learn a new game and then finding a group to play it. There's only so many weeks in the year, right? Yeah, <laughs> most of the time, I'm excused in trying something new. Is if I'm like, I can convince people like, hey, I'm gonna put this up on Twitch and stream it. You want to join me? <laughs> That's ninety five percent of it nowadays. So cool. Well, I mean, it's not that expensive, right? Like, I was looking at the at the site, and it's only a fifty dollar book. Yeah, it's not. Which, con considering it's a hardcover, full color, I mean, you know, D and D doesn't kind of do sh cheap garbage anymore. No. Um, it's probably gonna do well. Plus, I mean, 
they have packs, right? So every time they do an event, now someone's going to want to go buy the book. It's a good business play. So oh, yeah. yeah. No. Um, it, it, the thing is, like, I think um, with everything that's going on with D&D and their side, it's definitely like they are, they are, they're choosing their books pretty wisely. I think it's, I think that's the business model between, like, them and Paizo. I've always compared them. Paizo is very shotgun. You know, D and D I think was shotgun in third edition and is now more like control and three point five and three point five and in 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 Wizards is definitely now much more controlled with their release. Not that I'm well, the, the difference is the business model, right? So Paizo's business model is the adventure path. Mm. So they want to get you involved in their adventure path, and all the other stuff is built around the adventure path: the dungeon tiles, the decks. The uh, player's guide, you know, the campaign settings and everything. Um, whereas Wizards has just got the game, and then they can do called shots. Yeah, it's just a different, you know. It's, I mean, plus there's like what three people employed employed by Wizards on the D and D team full time. There's contractors, but heisel has got like fifty something people. So you, fifty people can make more game product than three. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's definitely been interesting that like. Uh... Like that's why I was re remarking that like Paizo took the original model that they kind of were doing for D and D, and then has made it much better their own. And I feel like they never burned out on it, which was great. Which I feel like the end of the end of third edition did some weird stuff. Like I will I will yeah. complain about the Book of Nine Swords just because it was kind of ridiculous. Uh, my friend, my friend made the joke because they would always make a joke much early on in D and D that back when I was a bit of a power gamer, I would take a spell that would turn me into a cockroach and do a hundred damage, and then they came out with an ability in that book that would just do a hundred damage. <laughs> oh no, I was just as bad, man. There was a so the great thing about third edition was like playable ra uh, monster races. Oh yeah, and they had mm -hmm. uh, they had one called a pedal, which was a um, diminutive. Fairy type. It was a basically a, a flower spirit, right? Um, but it had a plus six natural, plus six to like charisma, so it made the perfect sorcerer, right? Because you get the the bump stat, the bump, the plus three essentially to all your all your charisma stuff because of the plus six, um, and then your diminutive, so you're hard to hit, and so you just put everything into charisma, and then dexterity doesn't even matter because you're this small so nobody can hit you and then you know just have a familiar that's like a bat or something you know or a, a hummingbird and, you know and, and just you know ride around on your hummingbird and you're like fireball fireball you know like you're, you're un unbeatable at that point right so i, I had worse in third edition oriental adventures man they had some um have you ever played uh lord of the legend of the five rings role-playing game I did not play the original one, but we've looked into the new one, Fantasy Flight's done a little bit. Okay, so the third edition one was dual statted in the AEG system and D and D because Wizards owned. Um, okay. What L five R at the time, and so because it's Legend of the Five Rings, it's a very like you know Japanese and Chinese themed thing. There was a lot of stuff in there for like core intrigue and stuff, and so they had like the kimono of plus six charisma or whatever, and you always thought. Like, most of the time, people don't think that's a useful thing to do. But when you have prestige classes who, like the Aijitsu Master, who their effectiveness is determined by how well they can bluff you. Um, so you need a charisma. It's basically based on your charisma stat and your diplomacy score, which is based on charisma. So you could just dump your stuff into like intelligence and charisma and be like the most badass samurai ever. Now, you, you just normal all the time, but that first strike, you could do like a. 80 damage or 100 damage or whatever and then you're just normal but with enough like by 20th level if you build it the right way it's like i strike i cut cut your head off i sheath my sword i wait a turn i strike i cut your head off you know like it was just broken all over the place but it was fun yes and i think that's really what matters it was fun yeah there's a lot of fun things in third edition i like as much as i complained there was definitely a lot of like for well, for the back end of it there was definitely some fun things there. yeah yeah. Well, with the monsters, I I did that what troll o or half troll, half ogre. Half I don't know what you were as a base else. race, but you applied the two templates. Or, yeah, the yeah the. I think it was half orc, barbarian. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So my strength was just skyrocketed. <laughs> you, you, Why not? I was right? ridiculous. Yeah. You're that oh, dude yeah. from uh, the first Triple X movie, <laughs> the, the like the big Russian dude who was like, he just come. <laughs> You know him. <laughs> He's just like people punch at you, and you're like, "Oh, you're punching me." <laughs> yeah, I think I had it into five. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, my spreadsheet only goes to two uh, digits. I need a three-digit strength score now, please. I have a plus forty-nine to, to my, all my strength rolls. Oh uh, God. Uh, man. Yeah. And now I know. Now I know Joe. <laughs> so, so obviously, I like playing charisma characters that are weird, and, well, and he likes playing strength characters. Actually, what about you? no, I play mainly rogues and sorcerers. Yeah, that was just my one big dip okay. into a weird monster. He's, he's he like because he's a big man. He likes playing tiny people. Yeah, I like playing gnomes. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I like playing. Uh, I like building my characters so they can't get hurt. Like. <laughs> Uh, I played in this evil campaign and I was a necromancer assassin. Go figure. Um, not really. It's second edition D&D. &D. So, you know, basically I chose wizard, which meant I never got a new level. Um, but uh, <laughs> but my whole shtick was trying to like, I always wanted like the thing that made it so I wouldn't get hurt, you know, for whatever reason. And um, it made her kind of broken. But that was a fun campaign too. That's actually I, I play with that same group on Sunday nights sometimes, but we're playing fifth edition now. That makes me think of people. that makes me think of a um, person we used to play with, who made like the most undiable character possible in Pathfinder. Oh, my character died by the way when I went over, <laughs> went away when I went into the army. Uh, they kept playing my character and she died because nobody knew how to play her properly. <laughs> well, I think that person's character died too. It's just that like sometimes you can f f settle on those like if it's played right, it's nearly impossible to die characters, and they're vi they're interesting. Statistically, she was sh crap. I mean, I just played her that way. So the the, only th the funny thing is, I always take stats that don't make sense. I'll, I'll take six skill points in dancing <laughs> because I want her to be a dancer. Yeah. You know, like, it makes no sense, like, from an OP standpoint. If you were on, like, the RPG Net optimization boards, people would laugh at you for taking some of the stuff that I take in my characters. But I take it because of storytelling, not because it's, uh, it's going to be broken game-wise. Um, right. Because I'm more interested in kind of telling a fun story. Yeah. Um, I never do a. I never play a character that's smart because I can't play smart. I I just you know like or not smart. Um, it that good at debate. Like I'm not good at like arguing in real life. So I can't play that, and there's no real way to mimic that in game. So, I mean a a, a really strong person. I mean a really weak person can play a really strong person D and D right because you just roll. Yeah, right. smash you, but you can't really fake uh, charisma. Uh, you can't you, uh, like not the charisma mental, in the sense the mental stats. Yeah, yeah, you can fake intelligence because I can say, well, you know, I know I have a lot of knowledge skills, so <laughs> yeah, do yeah, I know yeah. something about this? But but debate or like like I even it didn't matter. I could have like a ninety-seven charisma score, and then no GM is going to allow me to talk my way through that you know zero level guardsman at the begin at the beginning of the adventure. There's no rolling for it, you know. Yeah. So I stay away from characters that are like leaders and diplo diplomacy types, and I just stick to things. If I do do a charisma um, thing, it's because I'm playing a sorcerer, and I just want to throw really badass. Spells. I think I think for me the best charisma character I did is I did in a lawful evil bard who was a politician. I can pull off politician. Not, like, not very good, like, you know, really diplomatic, more like, but you're an evil politician, so you're all about, like, you know, the So you were schizophrenic, you just changed your mind all the time? <laughs> no, 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 I was... You're just like, I think we're gonna go down the left-hand side, and then everyone goes to the left, and you're like, to the right, guys, and stuff. <laughs> Look, in that one, I also, I didn't sing, I didn't perform music, I gave inspiring speeches for my team. <laughs> oh, man, there was... There was a, I think, Hero Games, I forget what the hero system, there was a, a publishing company to this uh, Foxbat for President. Um, Foxbat is like this comic, uh, comic book villain. 
and we did when we did atomic ray we interviewed them about it and that was the funniest thing man it was like fox bat shoots the better you know like it was it was basically just comedic it was horrible uh it was it, just think politics in the 90s man and and that was what this it was hilariously fun um the guy michael citran that developed it who's unfortunately dead now um was a, a hilarious designer and um that was the closest i ever got to something like that cool well so. we should probably move on acquisitions incorporated yay yes, exactly. told you so, i would distract you no look we distract we, ourselves. We distract ourselves too. <laughs> okay, cool, cool. It's just What's a matter. Up next? Of, uh, so yeah, so it's available now if you want to check it out out there. Uh, teens in space. Let's talk about teens in space because um, one of my people in my streamed uh, vampire game uh, was someone who was running for a while a kids on bike stream. Um, cool. So I, I was very interested to see that they've done like a sci-fi spin-off, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, it's it's meant to be very, like... Because the kids on bikes, was, I guess, was always supposed to be more of that, like, you know, small town, kids, um... God, uh... I'm not remembering the movie name. The one with the five kids, or the kids go and... Stranger Things. Well, Stranger Things is a good example. I was trying to use a little yeah. bit more classic movies, you know? Goonies. Goonies, Stranger Things... Uh, the one where they find the body around the tra train tracks and go for that entire adventure. Oh, um, some... God, Stand by I me? know what you're talking... Stand by me, yes. I remembered it! <laughs> nice. But this is supposed to be, like, I guess, the same kind of thing except space travel, so I guess maybe, you know, the kid from Lost in Space. I don't, I don't have any good examples. There's probably some, like, uh, teenage space-based shows or something. I'm sure out there that I'm not even thinking about, but you know, <laughs> I find it interesting that that's you know the direction that they took from that, mm -hmm. that they went from like you know small town kid based stories that might have supernatural elements or not to uh, we're space traveling you know you know as younger people. Looks uh, like pre-orders are already up. Yeah, on PhD's are up. website. It's cool. Um, Twenty five dollars. So I mean, the thing yeah, is, it's an easy buy. If if you're experienced with kids on bikes, I mean, that's definitely something I could recommend. Um, I, I've got I, kids on bikes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't realize that because I don't know the other company. I I always thought it was the people that worked with Renegade. You know, I I uh, I think that the Hunters. I was thinking of them. For, Hunters books. Yeah, yeah. Hunters books. Uh, that's Ivan's company. Yeah, because I tried. I talked with someone from them at Pax Unplugged, so I didn't. I didn't realize they were published through Renegade then. Probably Ivan. Did he have curly hair? That sounds about Some right. Place. Yes. Yeah, that's Ivan. Because mm -hmm. I was talking a little bit about him about kids on bikes and uh, some of the other stuff they were working on there, but no, I, I'm I'm excited that they're doing more. I have to say. Um, Me too. So I I'm glad that they've uh, definitely thrown out this one. Again, like, I'm honestly surprised at the direction they took, but it's not a bad direction. You know, I if I would have thought about what direction I would have taken for a uh, RPG system like Kids on Bike and the setting it was, I don't know what I would have taken, though, personally. But it's interesting, like, that they definitely took a a sci-fi route. I like good sci-fi. So I do too. So, uh, anybody else want to add anything else about this before I like just push us on to the next one last bit? thing? Okay. Kids in space, or sorry, teens in space. <laughs> yes, so, that's all. But, but the little guy on a bike in space, a little. Ting, 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 ting. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they could reenact ET and just have him. <laughs> he just kept yeah, going. He just kept going. <laughs> he just kept going into space. ET, go home. I don't. But I don't, I don't have a helmet on. I don't want to go with you, ET. This seems like a bad <laughs> idea. Too bad. Anyway, okay. So that is teens in space. Uh, let's talk a few board games. Uh, Clip Cut Parks. Okay, 
uh, it's another Renegade Studio one, and this is an interesting one because, I mean, <sighs> we've had a chance to talk about a couple of, like, dexterity and a couple, like, weird mechanic board games out there, and I, I don't... I don't, okay, so I don't want to use, like, the, the actual thing of, like, weird mechanic as, like, a saying, like, this is, like, a really unusual one. Because this is definitely different, but, I mean, scissors. Scrap, and, sc sc scrapbooking board game? Yeah, it's, like, it's kind of what it feels like a little bit. That's, like, the scrapbooking board game, because you're, you're cutting out stuff to make a park. Um, do they... <laughs> You know, roll, cut, build. That's their little thing. Do they provide a lot of stuff to, like, enough stuff to clip out that you're not going to run out of things? Or will they have expansions, print out stuff? I'm curious as to that because. I I'm assuming, man. They got to build. Well, it says build one pad of park paper, 100 sheets. <sighs> well, I think that's the one thing about some board games that um, I do have a complaint about is, like, I, com I, I never see a a very big interest in the legacy games because if you... I like to be able to replay things in those legacy games like Pandemic or then like Betrayal where you're not supposed to play them again or it's not going to be the same experience if you ever do. Eh. Yeah, but that's the collector in you. The truth is that you probably only... If you really analyzed your games, you probably only pay, play a board game like nine times and that's probably the one you play the... Uh, the most more than like most games only get played once or twice and then they go on the shelf mm. we just don't like destroying our stuff yeah that's true mm. right but yeah i mean it's only 25 dollars. so if you were to play it you know 25 times you would run out of pads of paper right right so yeah. that's a lot if you play any game 25 times that's a dollar a play well yeah. and if you play with four people then that means that I, you know, twenty-five cents per person per play is not a bad spend. No, and the thing is, there are pads of paper you could easily copy to cut out more. You could, and, and yeah, the truth is, like nobody gets upset when they play Yahtzee and they have to use the little pad to write their score on it. So right, yeah. Because well, most of the time for Yahtzee, people could assume like, oh, you can erase that, <laughs> you know, or use it again. I think it's. I think it is that same thing of like they're providing enough stuff, so theoretically you should get your money's worth, definitely. And uh, I mean, it's is for eights plus. So I was I was curious about like I was thinking about it too the, for the scissors because like um, they're I'm, safety scissors. Yeah, they're they're safety scissors. Good. <laughs> My wife will approve that I come home with all my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like for me, like I would not, if, if I do not let my my six year old niece get near any scissors ever, because she'll just cut everything to destruction. No, let's give them exacto knives. Uh. Well, guys, I, I actually have to cut out. Oh, that's um, fine. We understand. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you guys, but it was really awesome pl uh, talking shop oh, no, with sure. you. We'll we'll, um, we'll let... hit up the rest of our things and uh, do you have a place like uh, oh okay, Shh, what do you want to shout out before you go kind of thing? Oh, pretty much anything. This is Game Roddy. Um, we're a Game Roddy on everything, so that's where you can find us. Um, right now, the the um, project I think is coolest that actually I'm not working on. I'm just think it's cool is the Fate Forge uh, Fifth Edition setting. Um, the art is phenomenal. Um, so that's the one I've been kind of been kind of going ooing and eyeing over lately but um, but yeah cool that's it yep and uh we'll i'll throw your like links of stuff up in uh the Twi um, youtube chat when i put this up online and let you know the link for it then cool. so thanks for joining well, us if i don't talk to you before then i'll see you at pax unplugged oh definitely yep yep see take guys. care yep bye all right let's just switch this over properly hey it switched mostly properly yay yes. So, just finishing up that quick conversation there, Clip Cut Parks. Um, it's available now. You have anything to add, Joe, on that one? No, it's an interesting concept. Definitely. Uh, you know, I've never seen one you had to cut pieces for before. Yeah, so. No, like, <sighs> there's a lot of, like, little manual and dexterity things and all these, like, little, like, gimmicks. But, like, something that has scissors, I haven't seen a gimmick for that yet. So... It's neat. Um, yeah. 
just because I pushed it off, why don't we talk about the magic topic? I, I just wanted to keep this simple anyway. Um, they've switched around the way that they do tokens. Um, I mean, like, with Magic Corset 2020, uh, we are in the spoiler season where they're showing off the cards and they're showing off all the, you know, mechanics they're bringing back for the core set and all that, all that jazz. And, like, I have to say, we've seen some full art stuff, but full art tokens are new. Yeah. Uh, I find it quite interesting, um, as a fan, token and fan collector of such things. Um, the art looks cool, too. I do have to say. Yeah, no, the art looks great. I'm always about wishy-washy with tokens. It's like, yeah, tokens, kind of cool. You don't really need them, is the thing. No. Dice make do. Yeah, you know. And that's what I normally do. I don't normally bother trying to find... Oh, God. Unless a token has a special ability, maybe, then I worry about it. I have a collection of tokens, and I, like, break them out once every, <laughs> like couple of years at this point in time you know I, I specifically went back uh, a couple of years ago and I bought a lot of the older tokens that I didn't have you know I specifically did that and this is a very cool selection of them it's just yeah <laughs> yeah I don't know it, if it's an evolution of a uh, level of quality in um, magic I wouldn't mind that. I mean, the art's been very good lately, and this is just, you know, another level of it. So, cool. It, it, this seems like a good direction, I'm going to say. So. Yeah. Um, so, full art tokens are actually going to be in Magic 2020. So, if you're interested in the set itself, uh, Wizards has their... Uh, card image gallery up, not with all of them, but you can also find some of the spoilers online and you can find the core tokens up on there. It'll be linked in this video for YouTube. So, one last thing I wanted to talk about today before we end to our uh, end segments is uh, Flotilla. So this is a new game that has been announced by WizKids where... An explosion in 1954, which was a hundred times more powerful than even the, like, wildest nuclear tests in the Bikini Atoll, apparently has ruptured the Earth's mantle, or ruptured it down to its mantle, causing water levels to rise and everybody to be floating on, like, cities in water and stuff. So, <laughs> this is a ridiculous storyline, I'm going to say that. The storyline is a very ridiculous... It's like... It's it's the Waterworld storyline. Yep. <laughs> so... Yeah. It's... It's the Waterworld storyline with less Kevin Costner. <laughs> Which... Again, for that movie, I don't know if it was a good thing or a bad thing. I'm gonna kind of leave it on that one there. But, uh, you know... Take it or leave it if you liked... Uh, that movie... But it, it's a three to five player game where you're exploring, salvaging, trading uh, to get victory points, and to be the most powerful commander in the uh, rebuilding society. Right. Um. So you kind of ex begin exploring the world in skiffs, rescuing survivors, diving for resources to sell and stockpile, um, and you can turn to. You can choose at any time in the game to turn sky side as they call it from sink side which is the skiffs by selling your skiff and building a flotilla basically like a floating city so it's kind of an interesting dynamic that you start out with um that you're basically like a savage uh rescue salvager kind of person and um then go on to the flotilla the idea of like the floating city that you're like being the commander of it Yes. It looks interesting. I definitely would want to see more about how it would play, though, because just the nature... It seems to... There's that complexity of this switch over. I don't think they have the rules up yet. Not at least on WizKids. Yeah, not, they'll put it up eventually. 
now again, it's like, uh, hmm, uh, they are saying uh, three to five players in the article, but two to five players on their overview of the game. So I don't know which is accurate, and they say ninety minutes, but the overview either they might have updated it to two players with the current kind of rule set, or they just oh, reset. they do have it actually. If you click the rules, they do have them. I tried clicking on it. Oh no, it didn't work. Yeah, I just didn't see the download rules button for um, in the other screen, and I'm like, oh nope, never mind. Um, now ninety this, minutes though. This game is costly. It's eighty bucks, but they do have one hundred wooden resource barrels. Yeah, ever th it, there's a lot of wooden pieces. Yeah, so I mean, uh, you, you have that. You have. Wooden outposts, thirty of them. Uh, thirty wooden yeah. influence wooden tokens, influence twenty are... wooden boats. Yeah. I, yeah, they have a. And most of the tokens are double sided. Yeah, they have they have a lot in here. Cus so seven custom multicolor research dice. No, I mean like it, it sounds like a lot for because it's an eighty dollar game, but with the level of wooden tokens and other things you're getting in here, it, it's. It is a lot of pieces to this game. It's a and that me, but with it being you know wooden pieces and stuff, you're talking better quality. Yeah, and WizKids always does a good job on their quality. So yeah, I, you know, um, I don't think we have a chance to talk about many of the higher end, more expensive games here. Usually, most of the games we talk about are between like forty to sixty, um, and. Most of the time, I think we've even gotten close to the $80 ones. It's like the ones that have like the big plastic miniatures that are the, you know, like, uh, build your own board kind of dungeon crawl type games. Those right. those tend to be around this price. But this one, it's it's got the price because it's got the stuff to match it. It's got a lot, again, a lot of wooden components. If you just, like, you just look at the kind of setup they have basically on on their the article which I'll probably link to the article because that leaks to their um, uh, storefront too the information storefront yeah but it's under pre-order now I think uh, it says it's coming soon so they haven't set an exact date um, but we can expect it sometime this year uh oh, october up on the uh information site for flip itself they're saying so right wow. around the time of um well of like a month two months in front of uh pax unplugged it'll be out but, cool so flotilla it that's an interesting one to keep an eye out on uh i think that's it for our regular segments today uh why don't we move on or no, not a regular segment, sorry, uh, news segments today. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to our regular segments. We don't have a deep discussion this week, uh, but I have good news. We will have one uh, for you shortly. We were we are actually getting a... Uh, uh, Brenda is actually sending us a copy of Everdale, which we, as soon as I get it in, uh, we will test it out, and we will let you know about it in a review segment. So I'm just, you know, keeping you guys informed of that out there. Do you have anything for Kickstarter Corner? Because I think I was going to talk about the two that um, Ed actually sent us links to. That's fine. You can go ahead and do that. Um, he was talking about Fate Forged uh, for 5th edition. So that's an interesting yeah. one. Uh, yeah, again, like, I when he sent the thing for it, and the art looks great. I mean, um, it, it's very high quality art. It's sword and sorcery overtones. Um, it's for 5th edition. So it's the rule set they're using. Um, in the designers of Shadows of Estrin, which are a, which is I guess the top tier French RPG, it's exceeded its pledge. Uh, they were looking for fifteen. They've got to fifty. Eighteen days to go. So it is definitely, it's funded, but it's not like, I wouldn't call it the insane funding. You know, it's definitely pretty high funded on it. Um. <clears throat> uh, it's kind of they they've got their own world they're basing it around uh fate forged world uh the world of uh iana e a n a mm -hmm. man uh, and, and they've got some like re really cool like set of like how they're showing off the art and stuff and if you just check out the kickstarter for how the art they're using it is really cool 
So it's an RPG and source book for uh, Fifth Ed. That's the easy way to describe it. You know, they got their world map. I'm just trying to find out if they've got any um, stretch goals. Oh, they do. Cool. Um, they've hit the ones that they've listed. Um, they've got... Oh, they had uh, a PDF of original scenario written by Ed Greenwood. Cool. Ed Greenwood does some great stuff. And um, and they hit the 40,000 one, which is all backers receive an art print of the covers of the adventure in Grimoire. So, art prints are cool. It's nice. Yeah. yeah. So that's what they've got to so far for it. And I believe the minimum for it that you could get behind it is... <coughs> Uh, that is not in. Oh, it looks like twenty-five uh, for the digital pl pledges, which you get um, the core book adventures, the grimoire spell book, the character sheet, and all the digital stretch goals. So, yep, twenty-five dollars gives you all this stuff for it. Nice. Uh, the other one he mentioned uh, that I'll give a shout out for is one that's. Uh, 25 Days to Go is the Dwellings of Evervale, Eldervale. I'll try to say that correctly. Um, it's a fantasy game. Uh, it has met its goal. It's nearly gotten to 300% its goal. It's a... I would compare it to, as we were talking about, those kind of like dungeon building board games, it looks like. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's necessarily the exact same. It's got its own kind of system, but it does have like miniatures and you know, a lot of stuff. So it, it actually uses some worker placement, um, special units, dwellings, uh, battlings, monsters, magic, elemental power. So it seems complex. It, complex without being too complex. It reminds me of like those like multiple mechanic worker placement games. We've played a few of those. Right. Uh, like Caverna had a little bit of that with the dwarfs, like where it had like the adventuring and some other thing, and like you're working on the mine side where you might build buildings and homes, and then you're working on the you know outside with the uh, farmland. So it's definitely uh, got some very good interest there, and it's the, the material from it looks very cool. And you get the basic game and a bunch of the stuff for sixty nine dollars. So. And there's a deluxe one for nine for ninety nine. So I mean, seventy bucks for a game like this is not a bad price. No, not at all. So uh, check those two out. I will leave links when I put this up on YouTube. Um, I'll actually throw the links up into chat now. So if you're joining us for the Twitch side, you will get those right away. Uh, do you have any other Kickstarter shout out, Joe? No, I didn't get a chance to today. I haven't been feeling 100%. Oh, no, that's fine. We got two from our guest, which was great. I, yeah. I should mention to him that we shouted out the Kickstarters you talked about in the chat anyway. Definitely. Um, are we can tabletop? Let's see here. Uh, last Saturday, we did Munchkin. Not Munchkin, uh, Flux. Yes. Flux, because we met a little late, and we couldn't go very late, so, you know, it just, the schedule was just awful for it, just, you know, with you know, me helping out, you know, mom, my mom, and getting dinner and stuff, and all that stuff. Yep, it happens. Yep, but we did get a little uh, Flux in, which was fun, um, and then on Sunday we did Unfair, just because we haven't played Unfair in quite a while. Yeah, and we like, hadn't. And, you know, because I didn't really have a lot of time that day to learn a new game, I'm like shoot, you know, that's one that we can do very easily and with the number of players we had possibly, uh, which was like four or five, that's right around the number that you can play with Unfair. So. Yeah, um, so it worked out well. Uh, if you're unaware, Legacies of Cain is on a, temp a temporary hiatus because we are technically down to like two solid players for that uh, game, so that's on Tuesdays, so hopefully that'll come back soon, but it requires to me to I have a possible third player. As soon as I get a third player, we will restart. Um, but I'm trying to look for also a fourth player. And uh, the two people that are on a fairly indefinite hiatus, I can always increase the screen, as I said, to my other players. I can always, you know, redo the background and just add space for more people. You know, 
Um, and then we did Madness of Land. Season finale. Yes, we did. Uh, you guys fought a dragon. They said I could have f thrown a harder dragon against you, but the fact is, the people I had fighting with you did very little. I think if I had them do nothing, because they did do some damage, Yeah. it might have just meant that, like, Grits would have probably dropped, Ulfgar would have probably dropped, but you... Uh, Zach and Signy were really not injured. You probably no. could have done some good damage to it. Because the thing is, by the time that it was there, because of its three attacks, because it, it recharged its breath weapon on when it got stunned. Yeah. If I'd done anything differently, it would have just been less damage from those other people. And it might have been able to live through the stunning. Maybe. You know? Yeah. So, definitely I can see, like, it could have even possibly ended that turn. If it hadn't been stunned, it probably would have, you know, breath weapon and done a huge amount of damage to some people again. I don't know where it would have targeted. It probably would have flown somewhere and targeted rather than, you know, been in the air fighting Gris and done it. They would have probably just tried to line up a line hitting multiples of you because still people were being bothersome. Right. But, no, it, it ended up interesting. Um, I think... No, it was a, it, it was a good fight. Um, I think you got lucky in a, a little ways, you know, and I think that was what matters. Well, yeah, exactly. Zach lucked out with Matt using all the charges on not breaking the wand. It's very hard to break the wand. And rolling, well, and rolling decent damage, though, too. On it. You were doing some decent things. You were managing to hit yeah. it even when feared. You, you even all were I doing damage. Messed up my, I mean, somehow messed up at some point my... Uh, attack that it's a D... Attack, you were doing a yeah. D1 yeah. instead of a D4. Yes. Or D6. Oh, sorry, D6. I keep forgetting that it, in D&D, fifth ed, it's yeah. D6. I keep thinking back to Pathfinder where it was a D4 for a hand crossbow. Right. Um, no, so yeah. Um, uh, yeah. The, the failure of it against the stun was really what crowned that entire end of that fight. But no, like, not recharging for two turns, it's breath weapon that would have changed things, it probably would have been tanking against Grits. Probably would have moved yeah. around a lot more. But it was it was kind of flying in the air, just fighting Grits, which it could do. You know, that's that's the thing, is it could do that, so it was just doing that. So. Very true. Um, yeah. That was uh, Madison Land. And that was our week in Tabletop. So now we go into our very final segment, which is called Consult the Table, which if you are out there in whatever format you're watching this and have a question for us, go ahead and give it to us. If you're in our Twitch chat and you want to ask us to address Lee, go ahead there. You can reach us at discussingtabletop at yahoo.com, uh, where you can email us a uh, question if you have it. You can also reach us, of course, at my Discord, uh, which the link to my Discord is, of course, in the below here in uh, both the Twitch channel and the YouTube side. I'll have to make sure the one on the YouTube side is actually still functioning correctly. I'll test it out. Let everybody know. Um, make sure it's good for these videos, because I haven't tested that in a while. And that's foolish of me. But anyway, yes, the link to Discord is there, where you can ask me directly uh, there. Either you can ask me directly on and message me directly through Discord, or if you are on the channel there, you can, of course, just leave it in one of the various chats there. And uh, you can also leave it in the chat of the YouTube video when it goes up online. Uh, any question you ask, we will answer it to the best of our abilities. Uh, if it's something that we feel like is more appropriate to answer on the show here, we will answer on the show. Or it's something that we feel is appropriate to share with everybody, we'll do the same with that. But if it's just something simple, we'll ask it. We answer questions that are related to RPGs. CCGs like Magic, board games, or just nerdy stuff, too. So if you got, like, you know, if you just want to ask about some kind of random nerdy thing, like, you know, uh, go ahead. Anyway. Hey. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for joining me again. 
Oh, of course. Everyone have a good Saturday, and I'll see everyone tomorrow for some uh, tabletop. And thanks again to Ed uh, Healy for joining us. Uh, it was great to have him. It actually, I he was I, I enjoyed having him on. Actually, he we had some great discussions yeah. with him. Yeah, I would love to have him on again. And um, we'll see you here next week at the same time. Uh, got another guest lined up for it. Uh, should be on uh, schedule for it. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, tomorrow that is the tabletop. So yep. See you all there then, but folks, and you have a great rest of a Saturday. All the other important links are down below. Remember to follow for some extra support or top uh, left for uh, if you want to really give some support and get some, you know, stuff for some subscription. So, yep. Bye, everyone. Bye.